Hello and welcome to this masterclass on building custom shaders in Houdini 16. My name is Kai Ginski. I'm the Senior Technical Director for SideFX Software. Let's first go over what we'll talk about. So first of all, I'll introduce material networks. Uh, these are a new context where you build and create shaders in Houdini 16, and you're able to use shaders with utility VOPs all in the same context. I'll show the new UI that we have for VOP nodes, the concept of mixing shaders, visualizing the output of any VOP by assigning it as a shader directly, and the concept of core shaders. Then we'll go a bit deeper and look at building your own custom shaders in this new context. For that, we'll be using the Material Builder node. We'll look at how we can build shaders that are layerable, supporting your own custom exports with layering, as well as independent mixing of surface and displacement shading. Then we'll also look at how you can use the new OpenGL tags to visualize your shaders in the viewport much more easily than before. Let's start by looking at the new material network context. The most obvious place you can find that is at the top level here in slash mat. But you can also create a material network in any other context. For example, at the object level here, you can type material network and create one. And then inside here is really just the same. I'll jump over to slash mat. And the nodes we create in here are Bob nodes. So you have access to all of the shading Bobs that were accessible before. But the main difference here now is that the shaders themselves live at the same level. So before you would have created, for example, interior builder is sort of the equivalent of a um, material shader builder in the old world. Previously, the VOP nodes would have only been accessible within here. And then at, uh, at this level, where you have your shaders, you weren't really able to do all that much with them, apart from assigning them to objects and manipulating their parameters. So in this new world, the shaders live at the same level here. So I can create a principal shader, assign that to an object, render it. And at, that, at this point, I'm basically doing all the same stuff that I was able to do before. I can manipulate the parameters here. The interface is pretty much the same as it was before. Uh, while the, the principal shader has received updates and a revamp of the interface, uh, that really had nothing to do with the transition to this new context. It's really pretty much the same concept. What's new, though, is because we have a VOP node now, we're able to uh, plug things into the inputs of the shader. So I can expand this input group here, which, uh, by the way, is derived from the parameter groupings. So we take the top level uh, top level folders here and generate input groups for those. And it just makes using this type of node much, much easier. I think this one actually has over 200 inputs. So it's, it's kind of unwieldy and impossible to use if you don't have something like this. And with this new interface, I find myself usually just expanding the surface group here. And I don't need the other ones all that much, especially textures. You usually just use the parameter interface for that, and there's no need to overwrite that most of the time. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on how to use these shaders. That's pretty much unchanged, but let's see what we can do with this new context now. For example, let's grab a procedural pattern bob here, like the cellular noise, for example. I can just plug that into one of the inputs here. Let's just use base color, maybe add a color mix. Or I'll increase the frequency a bit so we get something a little bit more interesting. Just a color mix. Plug that into the bias value here, and then we can use the black and white output of the cell noise to mix mix different colors. So this is obviously something quite simple, but um, Given a shop shader that we had before, it was quite difficult to do something like that. If you if you were using the built-in shader and then found that you just needed something a little bit different, maybe just the procedural pattern, you had to then unlock it, jump inside, try to understand all this stuff. It's the structure is pretty pretty simple actually. This these are all the texture uh, surface texture inputs, but you would have to find the input that you want, override it in here, and then maybe save. Uh, your own version of the shader. So all of that, for this type of simple modification, all of that becomes unnecessary now. You just plug something into the shader and modulate it. And not only can you do that, uh, you can also 
grab these nodes that are not really shaders uh, in themselves. They're just basic prop nodes with some outputs and assign those directly to objects. The way that works is we generate a shader on demand when you do that. You can inspect that shader here when you view Xcode. So you see that automatically generated shader option here. It's always enabled for this type of node. And we have the code for cell noise here. And then the output of that is assigned. It's converted to a vector because it's a float. We're just using the first input in this case. And it's assigned to the CF global variable and as well as well as CE, which is how it ends up uh, being rendered by Mantra. You can also grab the color mix, of course. And if I was to do something like a fit range here, maybe I want to grab my uh, zero to one cell noise values and just map that to something else. Like I want to pipe that into the roughness of the principal chair, maybe. And I don't want the zero to one, one values. I want something between 0 0.2, 0 0.6. Let's render a principal shader. So I can render the shader with the final result directly. So here you can see the variation and roughness between uh, the lines and the, the areas in between. But you can also just grab the fit and visualize that directly. Small side note here. Keep in mind that when you visualize these types of outputs, the display uh, defaults to gamma 2.2. So sometimes you may, it may be useful to just set that to one uh, to visualize the values better. Now, most of the shaders we ship, like the principal shader and the classic shader, which is just the new name for uh, Mantra Surface, they come with another variant called the core shader. So we have principal shader core, for example. And really, um, the, the main difference is that they don't come with all the texture inputs. So they're sort of intended for cases where uh, you already know you need something a little bit different. Maybe you're uh, going to generate everything based on procedural patterns, and you don't need all of this, um, all of the principal shaders, extra inputs, and all that stuff. Uh, you can just use this one. So this is a pretty good base. Like if if the shading model fits your needs, uh, you don't want to build that from scratch. But you just want to modulate inputs. Uh, this is a pretty good node to use. I'll just plug the same inputs into here that I had before render that and we should see uh, pretty much the same. Uh, also doesn't have displacement, by the way. Now, another difference between the core and the full version, as you see this icon here, that tells us that the code in this node has been cached. So uh, not to be confused with compiling the code. Cached code just means that we've taken all these swap nodes with their connections and generated the VEX code from that. And this is what you see when you view VEX code here. So this is the code that's been produced by all these nodes inside. And with a complex network like this, this can take some time, especially when you have dozens of shaders. So when you move into production and you want to do some serious rendering, that's usually a good idea to set up shaders that have this. So it's, it's perfectly fine to start up like this and maybe even use this in production. But you may find some delays with uh, render startup after a while when you have a few of these. So rather than uh, just collapsing that into a subnet, like with Shift C, instead use collapse selected into material. Basically, that creates a material builder with your nodes inside, and it adds a few more nodes. So the main one is surface exports. Actually, we don't really need all these connections. The layer should transport everything. And we don't need the collect node for now. We only need that when uh, we want a displacement shader as well. So if you had displacement, you would create another output variables and parameters node, set that to displacement and plug that in here. And then this is where you plug in your displaced position and normal. We'll do an example with that a little bit later. Let's just get rid of that for now. So this one is now ready to be used. I can assign that here. Um, but note this icon here. It's not filled in at the moment. This just indicates that this node is able to cache code, but it hasn't done so yet. So you'll see when I render now, that icon's going to fill in. That's because uh, the code for it has been generated once because Mantra needed it. And the next time I run this now, 
if I don't make any changes inside, the code is already cached and we don't have to uh, wait for it again. Now, in this case, it's pretty much instant, but again, when you have complex shaders, it can make a big difference. Now, compared to the built-in shaders, there's an important feature missing here. And that's the layer output. Let's just see how we can use that layer output with the built-in shaders. So I'll take another principal shader. Or maybe I'll grab some from the material palette. Uh, let's just take a gold. And let's see, something different, metal, metal grate. We'll take those two. And using the layer outputs, we can mix and layer these two shaders. Let's just see what they render as individually. So that's gold and metal grate. Well, we'll just scale that down a little bit. So with the layer mix, now this has existed uh, before Houdini 16, but uh, you can, you know, since the uh, full Uber shares existed in a different context, you couldn't reuse it with that. So you were only able to use it with the core shaders. So now I can take these shaders and notice, so when I apply the layer mix with its defaults now, it's going to be a 50-50 mix between the two shaders, uh, which probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I'll, I'll plug something into the alpha to, uh, to blend it in different regions of the character. And also notice that we still have these uh, cache icons here. And that just means even when I use the layer mix here, which basically causes this whole thing to be compiled into one shader, uh, we're still using the cached uh, individual shaders. So let's just see what that does to our shader code quickly. It basically just means, so this is all the layer mix code. And this part is actually calling these shaders. So we don't compile the whole code of the shaders into the code of the uh, the wrapper shader. We just call uh, the shaders from the other one. So the wrapper shader generated for this layer mix calls uh, these ones, and they're cached by Mantra already. So there's no additional, or very little additional cost to calling them from the shader. Uh, we don't have to generate the code for them or anything. Now, uh, for mixing these two, let's just use uh, rest position. That just gives me uh, the object space position. Let's just visualize that again. So that's the position here. Since I don't have a rest attribute on my geometry, it just uses P, uh, but it still transforms uh, the values into object space. Otherwise, otherwise I would get uh, camera space values. This is what you get then, which doesn't make a lot of sense for what I'm trying to do. Uh, that would be the same as using uh, global variables, just using the P here. By the way, um, you can't visualize that one directly. Uh, you can't assign the globals to an object directly, but you can just pipe in a null, and then you can assign that one. And that way you can decide basically which, um, which output you visualize, because we just grab whatever uh, output this node has and use that as uh, to assign it to the to the shader output cf which is then rendered um let's go back to this one again very useful to be able to visualize that here and we'll just grab the x axis going across there and i want to blend across the middle here you could actually plug that in as is Um, but let's actually fit that and do a transition across the middle here. So I want to blend between a fairly small negative value and a fairly small positive value, go between 0 and 1. I can see a tighter gradient here. And then when we assign the layer mix, we'll see that gold uh, blending into the metal grate. And it includes all of the displacement shading as well. So all of that is handled in one go, you don't really have to think about those, uh, those variables. Let's shift that over a bit. 
Now let's go back to this material builder that we had before. As I mentioned, uh, we don't have that layer output here. So let's let's take a look at how we can add that. I'll assign this one again. So for surface shading, it's pretty straightforward. And just create a parameter box. And we set that to export always. And just call it layer. That's not a requirement, which is nice to call it the standard name. Shader layer as the label. And then we want a struct. Since the layer output is a type, a type of struct. And the type here is shader layer. The struct, by the way, is just basically a collection of um, multiple primitive values like vectors and floats. You can also have structs within structs. Uh, that's all the shader layer really is. So it collects all these standard outputs that we have on shaders into one uh, variable. So I'm taking the layer of my principal shader here and outputting that, exporting that from the shader. By the way, it's important to use a parameter pop. Don't use a bind export because those don't generate any UI. So in Houdini 16, we've extended that concept to mean uh, parameters as well as inputs. So with a bind pop, you don't get any parameters on the top. You don't get a parameter exposed. Um, in this case, we get it, which that doesn't really make sense for the layer. But we do want the output, which you wouldn't get with the bind uh, export either. So um, I'm jumping back up again to hide this uh, guy here. It doesn't really do anything. We'll set this to invisible. Now when I jump up, there's no parameter there, but we still get the output. So rendering that. Should still get the same thing. Now I can mix this one as well. So if I make a copy of this and uh, I'll jump inside and just make a small modification. I'll just switch that over to a checkered pattern. And I'll use a color mix again. Plug that into base color just so we get something different. So that one on its own. We'll render this. I'll copy the layer mix here that we had before. Just plug these into the A and B and assign that one. And we should see the same transition, but now between these custom build shaders. So that works. Now, um, instead of using the principal shader core, I could also go to more basic components like the ones you find in shading BSDFs here. So these are individual lighting components that you can use. Uh, for example, the PBR diffuse will just give you that basic uh, diffuse reflection. I'll use the, I'll reuse the color here, uh, the roughness as well, actually. And we'll plug the layer output both into our shader export as well as the surface exports which pipes it through to the outputs. Rendering that, we should now see just a diffuse without any reflection on this side. So looking very flat there. So you can build up a shader like that as well. Um, I'll just add a reflection as well. So I'll grab a PPR reflection. This is a new concept, by the way, this uh, base input and the reflection. Uh, if you pipe the diffuse into that, it just means that the reflection will be layered on top uh, of the diffuse. So this um, means that you don't have to do any of the Fresnel blending that you had to do before. So before you had to create a, create a Fresnel VOP, um, use all these values correctly and uh, plug in your IOR and all that stuff. No, that's all handled for you. So it'll do the correct energy conserving blending using the IOR that you set on the node itself. We should see a reflection there. I think I need a different light uh, to make it show up. We just have a headlight. So there's that backside there. It doesn't really receive any, any reflections. All right, that works. So we see the highlights there as well. So that all works fine. Now, if you wanted to use displacement like we had here, 
uh, you need a f you need to do a few extra steps. The main reason for that is that um, the surface and displacement shader they are compiled separately uh, by Houdini. That's because we don't want um, we don't want all of the computation that's happening on the surface shading to also end up in the displacement shader. So when you take a look at the principal shader, just cancel rendering. You see that this is basically the displacement outputs uh, going into a collect node here. They're all coming from down here. It's a separate network. So uh, when this um, when the shader uh, is sent over to Mantra, we compile uh, first the surface and then the displacement shader, and they each get their own code uh, without any crossover. Now. For the displacement, if I were to set that up here, let's just grab a um, displace along normal. Or actually, let's grab a displacement texture, which is hard code as a path for now. Just grab a the wood chips texture here. And then, like I, like I showed you before, Create output variables and parameters, and switch that over to displacement. We'll plug in the position in normal, and that then goes into a collect node with the surface shader as well. And actually, we're also going to need a properties uh, VOP where we can specify displacement bounds. So plug that into there as well, and then go to rendering parameters on that one. We we'll look for bound and displacement bound here. Add that, add that using the arrow here. Accept, and I'll set that to a value. Basically, you always want to set that to something that's higher than any replacement, any displacement value you have anywhere on your surface. So just set that to one, which is going to cover everything for now. Ideally, you would uh, hook that up to any expressions that you have in displacement scale and so on. Well, it's not all that important for this case. So this is a functioning displacement shader on its own now. If I assign that here, I've got a bug here with my, uh, I think the layer output doesn't update correctly when I add all these outputs. That should be fixed very soon. Rendering that I should get yeah, some crazy displacement because I have very high values here. Let's just reduce that a little bit and re-render, uh, because the displacement shader doesn't update correctly with IPR yet. So that works. But I need to do some extra work to make that uh, go through the layer struct as well. Because at the moment, uh, the layer is only involved in the, uh, in the surface exports here. What I need to do is and copy that uh, export and set up a separate one for the displacement output. So it's going to be the same name. I just want to make sure that I can I can build my own my my separate struct here for um, for the displacement values. And for that, I'll use a layer pack and just pipe in the position that normal. We can ignore. Uh, these the BSDF opacity and emission because these are only needed for surface shading. I will plug that into this bob. Now, to tell these uh, these nodes that one of them is uh, supposed to be for surface shading and one of them is supposed to be for displacement shading, we have this new option here: um, use own export context. So you want to enable that on both, and then we use export in context. Which is which is not new. That's been there before because it, it has other purposes as well. But in this case, we'll get rid of surface and add displace. So that now means when we compile. Oh, let me actually show you at the top. We still have we still only have the one layer output because both of these are named the same. But basically, now when uh, Mandra wants to compile a displacement shader uh, with that's calling this one. So if we plug this in here, and it's compiling a displacement shader for this uh, combination of nodes, then when it calls this shader, it'll use 
this output to get to get the displacement values. So, so this is how it gets at the position at normal. Let's just because I haven't set all of that up here. Let's get rid of this one and just use it with one of the shipping shaders. So that shows you how you can build a custom shader that's totally compatible with all of this layer mixing stuff we set up in the shaders we ship. So that should work now. I still, yeah, I, I still have this one assigned, so I need to assign the layer mix. We should get a mix of the metal grade principal shader and this one. So as you can see, both of them has to have displacement. And by the way, this one, uh, this one needs information about displacement bounds as well, but we generate that automatically. So this traverses any connected nodes, finds displacement bounds that have been set up here. So this one, principal shader has a nice expression that uh, computes the maximum of all the various displacement options you have here. And then this one, uh, we've set a fixed value for now. We, we could link that up as well. Uh, but basically, it'll take the maximum of those two. So in this case, it'll use our displacement bound of one that we set up here. Uh, so it's it's on the safe side, but not quite optimal. So when you build your shaders, you should take care of that one as well. All right, so that's all working nicely. Um, and you might choose to stop at this point. Uh, you're going to get uh, any of the shading sh that you set up here, surface and displacement, that's all going to work. Um, but another aspect that you might want to set up is um, shader exports. So let's just set up a very basic one. We'll set up, or no, let's, let's look at the uh, ROP, the mantra ROP first. And we'll see what we get out of some of the uh, standard exports. So these are mostly used for uh, texture baking. So let's render out uh, base color. And you'll see currently uh, we actually don't get anything, not even for the principal shader. Uh, we do get it when we assign the principal shader directly. So then we get base color and all these other guys. Let's just activate them all. So emission color we don't have. Um, we have diffuse color. Spec color is just white in this case. Set this one to be metallic. We should see some colored spec color, uh, tinted spec color, spec roughness. Uh, diffuse darkens because when you set, uh, when you increase metallic, the diffuse response uh, decreases. So that's all expected. That's all working. Uh, the the thing is when you assign the layer mix, uh, we don't we don't really use that shader. That, that shader isn't the final node anymore, and we use the layer output to get all the information from the shader. That means all these exports have to be added to the shader as well, uh, and they will be mixed by the layer mix. Now there's uh, there's a cost to that, and you may not want that to happen because maybe you don't need all those outputs. So we decided to make that uh, that an option on the ROP, uh, on the baked texture ROP, where you're very likely to use those exports. Uh, it's enabled by default, so it's on the baking tab here. Add baking exports to shader layers. Um, on the Mantra ROP, it's not. Uh, you have to first of all add those baking options. We'll go to Mantra Baking, just add that whole folder, and enable Add Baking Exports to Shader Layers. Now when we render, we'll see that base color, at least on the principal shader. And if we use this layer mix up here with two principal shaders, you'll see all of the values mixed. So base color, metallic, spec color. That's all working. Now to support those exports in our own custom shader, we have to do two things. So one, uh, you do the same thing that 
we had before you do a bind export. Let's just uh, promote our So this is going to be our base color. Let's just promote that using a bind export. So I'll call that export. We do that. We do that uh, with Houdini 16 with all our standard exports. We prefix the name with export underscore just to disambiguate from input parameters that you might have. So export base color. Um, I don't really need to set the type because that's derived from the input value override type with input here. And that should give me the export as soon as I render it. So when you assign the shader directly, that already works. But when you mix it, that's still going to be missing. And that's because we need the second step. And that is to add that value to the layer struct as well. And for that, we have set layer export. We'll set that to the same type and same name. And plug in that same value. And that'll make it show up. So when you do have it in the struct, then the layer mix will uh, mix it correctly with built-in shaders. We can just chain another set layer export here. And maybe we also want to promote or export uh, roughness. First of all, I'll promote that to a parameter. And then I'll use that value to plug into here and create another bind export. And this time call it rough. Use the same value. And here we'll call it rough as well, export rough. Well, actually, it should be uh, spec rough for the for the standard export on the ROP. Specular roughness. No, it's zero at the moment, so let's give that a higher value. So that mixes nicely as well now. So you could obviously add more uh, more lighting components here and uh, texture inputs and so forth. And then at some point, um, you may want to turn this into an HDA as well. The additional advantage that gives you is, well, first of all, you can distribute uh, it to other users then. Uh, but it also allows you to save the cached code like uh, with the shaders we ship. In this case, uh, the caching happens whenever you render it, but it's not really saved in the scene. Uh, so it just means when I save and reload that scene, let's just do that uh, for a second. Save that under a different name. And when I uh, open that again, So these ones are still cached because the cache code is actually saved as part of the HDA file, but this one isn't. Creating a digital asset will fix that for us. Just call that my material. And let's create that HDA. And then the only thing you really need to do for uh, code caching is save cached code. So when I do that and match current definition, uh, it's cached. And it'll still be cached when I reload the scene. Uh, this is a bug in the current version, by the way. That'll be fixed very soon. Uh, it disconnects the outputs whenever you match definition. So I'll save that and reopen it. So that's still cached as well now. And actually, um, jumping inside, it gives me this note saying that there are no nodes inside uh, because it doesn't need it allow editing of contents will load all the nodes. And that's another big advantage as well. So even when you load a scene uh, that has a bunch of shaders with hundreds or maybe thousands of nodes, uh, this can make a big difference. So even before you render, it has to load all the pop nodes that are contained, which it, it doesn't when it's, when it's already cached. Now with that, we've covered most of what you need to build shaders in material networks. Uh, you can use these methods uh, to add more lighting components, promote more parameters, export uh, various AOVs. Uh, but one more thing I want to look at is viewport rendering. Uh, there have been some great improvements with this in Unity 16 as well. This example that I have here is just a brick shader from the material palette. 
And you can see that we have viewport displacement as well as uh, various other textures, the base color, of course, but also uh, roughness. Um, and the representation of the mantra shader here is very accurate in the viewport. Rendering that uh, with the render region, it's actually pretty difficult to tell the difference. Um, so it's not a perfect match, but it's uh, very useful to dial in shading values and uh, displacement properties. So for example, if I change the effect scale here, it all updates very, very quickly. And it's a, it's a very good match with the mantra shading. You'll see all of that matching nicely here. Now, for your own shaders, you can also set that up. And that process has been made a lot easier in Houdini 16 as well. Uh, let's just look at it with this example here. One thing to note, though, is the viewport shader is sort of hard-coded. You assign a mapping between the parameters you've set up for mantra shading and uh, the parameters on the viewport shader. We'll see how that works in a second. Um, let's just jump inside the shader for now and look and look at what the mantra shading looks like. So it's very similar to what we had before, just a PBR diffuse here uh, with a diffuse color parameter and a diffuse texture being multiplied together. That then goes into the color channel here. And there's a reflection where I've exposed the specular model, the roughness, and the IOR. And and on the displacement side, we just have a displaced texture where I've exposed a few parameters as well. And again, a property swap with displacement bounds. So on the mantra side, see what that looks like. So I've added some textures here and just set the parameters roughly. Um, and I've got this, these metal grade textures, so uh, the displacement and the base color. Now, to set up the viewport shading, uh, what you do is you go to uh, Edit Parameter Interface if you don't have an HDA yet. If you've created an HDA from this, then just uh, do this in the Type Properties. And here we have our VOP parameters. Um, and basically, what we want to do is add some tags to these. So this is an old concept. They've been around for a while, but we didn't really have any, a UI for it. So we've added this UI now. And we've added this concept of OpenGL tags. So we've got these built-in tags that you can add, uh, which also gives you an idea of what uh, what features are supported by the OpenGL shader. So we have uh, tags for most of the things that uh, the principal and classic shader use. So those are quite well supported now. And you also have parameters for textures and disabling and enabling textures and the texture path itself and some things like the channel from the texture that we use for shading. Um, so for this diffuse color here, I'm just going to assign the diffuse tag. And right away, that changes the viewport output. And you'll see as I change that now, that updates live in the viewport. So it's as simple as that. Um, diffuse texture, I can assign that as well. Again, built in tags. And uh, while you're working with the diffuse, you can also add a filter here that's remembered when you close uh, this window. So it's a nice way of, of speeding that up. Uh, add the texture. And notice how the diffuse texture actually, support, actually supports multiple layers of textures. Uh, they are blended using the alpha contained in the texture. So when I create that, the name contains this hash, which will be uh, replaced with the with the idea of a multi-parm if I put that in a multi-parm. In this case, I just want the one texture. So I'll just call that OGL text one. And that works as well. And uh, just like in the mantra shader, uh, it's multiplied. But again, if you were to do something very different in the mantra shader, you couldn't. Uh, there's a chance that you can't really represent that in the viewport. So it'll always just multiply the diffuse and the texture. That's all it can do. Uh, you'd have to write your own OpenGL shaders to do something else. Let's just go through here and assign all, all of these. So um, specular model, I'll just type in spec here to quickly find these. Specular model, then we have um, roughness is actually just roughness. And index of refraction, 
Uh, it's also new that this is supported directly in uh, OpenGL. We used to have to add some uh, expressions to reflectivity to sort of fake index of refraction affecting affecting the reflection intensity. But now that just works out of the box without any trickery. And um, we'll add the displacement values here as well. So displacement map, displacement offset. So as you can see, it's a pretty quick process, at least assuming that your uh, your, your mantra shader is a pretty good match for the OpenGL shader. It's pretty straightforward to do all of this stuff now. And let's just render. And again, we should get a pretty good match here. So that concludes this masterclass. I want to thank you for your time, and I hope this has been useful.